but how how should the church think about this as you've reflected on this issue? Well, I, I really have not uh, tried to say how the church should uh, deal with the subject in general. I think it's better when the church is changing to say we are changing. Now the uh, doctrine on religious liberty uh, adopted by Vatican II, the Dignitatis Humanae, is a wonderful declaration of belief in religious liberty, but when it gets to the history of the church, it says this was not clear due to the vicissitudes of history. Well, that's a wonderful phrase. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't say these people were wrong. <laughs> and I guess it was too much for the church fathers to say so. I mean, too much psychologically. But, uh, and perhaps there's always that problem with authority. Uh, let me give you two other, I mean, the, the, the basic problem, I think, for any authority is to say I was wrong because then the person who was listening to the authority will say, well, how do I know you're right now? <laughs> but we do have examples, uh, most notably in science. The scientists all the time are saying, we were wrong, but now we have a better theory. And this is what we see as the, and I think once that becomes the way of doing things, it's, it's quite, the authority is not shaken. Uh, in my own experience, uh, we see it when the courts interpreting the Constitution of the United States. Uh, here's a very comparatively simple document compared to some theological documents. It's only a couple of hundred years old. How many times has different opinions been adopted? Well, at least 40 or 50 times. The Supreme Court has said this means something, now it means something else. And uh, sometimes the court will say we're overruling it, sometimes they won't say it. But anybody who works in this area knows that this is the way things happen. That courts uh, change their mind, different insights occur, and the experience dictates uh, that they should change. And it doesn't, I think, uh, undermine the authority of the courts. Because it does give uh, someone who disagrees with a particular doctrine uh, some reason to think, well, maybe I can persuade them eventually. And I think the one thing that the courts offer uh, as perhaps a weak analogy uh, is at least there's a mechanism in the, in the in litigation of cases, the change to be brought to the attention uh, of the judges and pressed upon them. <coughs> Whereas the church doesn't quite invite that. Uh, I think there might be a, uh, some methods to help for uh, uh, people to talk to the authorities and say, "This is we, we see this, would you explain out why you don't? And, and that touches upon one of the critically difficult elements in the life of the church, I think, today, and that is, uh, I was, uh, when I was studying in Rome as a student, um, Cardinal Ratzer came and talked to a group of us, and he said, uh, someone asked boldly uh, about uh, dissent. When do we have the right to dissent from church teaching? Of course. Uh, the church would rather call this withholding a sin. Okay. And his, uh, Conor Ratzinger's answer is, this pleased half the crowd and pleased half the crowd. What he said was, in order to know how to handle this, you need to read uh, Lumen Gentium, uh, uh, the church's teaching, in light of the manualist tradition. Well, those of us who had gone to the seminary in the 70s and 80s cringed at and manualist, but in fact, the manualist tradition had a very sophisticated notion of withholding dissent, precisely to have a vehicle for change. That is, theologians in the ancient traditions of the church, the manualist tradition of the church, 
had a right to withhold dissent on teachings and push for changes uh, in areas where they felt the church had gone in the wrong direction. And that worked very well within the theological communities. But the problem is all of that took place behind closed doors. And it was a good system for its day, but it was not, it doesn't translate well to global communications. <laughs> because how do you, what you had was, now, sometimes it wasn't gentlemen, but you had a process, there was a vehicle of, of exchange of views among major theologians and bishops that was quite, you know, as they say in diplomatic language, a frank and honest exchange of views. That went on. So there was a mechanism of doctrinal change and evaluation and reexamination. The problem now is it's also public. Um, do you have any thoughts on how, you know, the courts deal with this, but how do we as a church deal with this question of doctrinal development and interchange of views and retain the effectiveness of the old mechanism in an age where there is going to be no privacy to any opinion to Well, I, uh, I'm sure we're all trying to find creative ways. Uh, you mentioned Cardinal Grassley in a, as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Uh, he issued the statement uh, as to uh, dissent from non-infallible pronouncements. I can't give you the site off the top of my head, but it is in the book. And uh, he, the statement agreed. If the statement is not infallible, it's fallible, and it can be changed. And he tells the theologian who doesn't uh, agree with it to communicate his doubts to the congregation. Well, that's a, a nice private channel, but it doesn't work very publicly at all. And you, you don't know how... Uh, the, the danger, of course, is that in any uh, institution, a bureaucracy may be the uh, uh, hand that receives suggestions. And bureaucracies aren't very inclined to change. They want to do things the way they've always done them. So uh, finding, I, I would think, thinking aloud, that probably uh, uh, something like the council was the best way of changing things. That was certainly uh, a wonderful experience for those of us who actually were there, this group of 2,000 bishops, making substantial changes in the life of the church and uh, at the time people said well let's do it again soon <laughs> people said Vatican II should be followed by Notre Dame I but uh, of course that's not happened <laughs> we're going to go to questions just a minute I just want to uh, on one last question so we talked about, about a change in the life of the church to talk a minute about um, our own society, and uh, particularly you've been at the uh, nexus of universities, uh, the university communities, uh, the legal community, and, and the church, in so many roles uh, that you have played in your life and contributions that you've made. What would you say, if I could ask you, what would be your view of the primary effects in the contemporary societal understanding in the United States about the role of religion in public life. What would you say would be the primary defects in terms of within the leadership of the church about its understanding of the, the proper public role of, of uh, religion in American public life? Well, it, it does seem to me that there is a more explicit uh, attacks on religion 